everyone, I'm Marianne Taylor, the house detective, and I thought I might start doing a fortnightly overview of what I've been researching and any interesting things I've uncovered called the detective diaries. So this is number one. So the top five interesting or unusual things that I have come across this week are one, where Ardoin Road at Corinda gets its name from. Secondly, I'll be telling you about a sneaky little trick that I uncovered for finding out the owner's name of a property when the title was damaged and I couldn't read it. Number three is the War Service Home Scheme. Number four is the Nudgee Orphanage and the horrible decisions that unmarried mothers had to make in the past. And lastly, I will be talking about one of the first places to offer accommodation specifically for gay men in Brisbane, which is an absolutely fascinating story. So I hope you enjoy watching. So where does Ardoin Road get its name from? Well, I was researching a house that's situated along that road and in the process, I was doing a bit of background research into the early land ownership and I uncovered that the road originally led to a property known as Consort Cliff, which was established quite early on in the area's history by Reverend William Gray. But in 1885, the property was owned by Charles Collins and he built himself a grand residence on that same land, which he christened Ardoin after the place in Ireland, I presume. So the road leading to the house became known as Ardoin Road. There you go. But extra bonus information, the house was later converted for use to accommodate children with uh, physical handicaps and became known as Montrose and it was used for that purpose for many many years Unfortunately, it's since been demolished the amazing house, but never mind we it lives on in the name of the road Secondly, this is basically just so I can boast about how clever I think I am. I had a title, the same house at Corinda. I had bought the certificate of title for the property which gives you all the landowners' names. However, this title was quite damaged and the bottom was missing from it. So I really wanted to know the owner's name at a particular period of time because it would help me work out when the house I was researching was built. Uh, but that bit was missing from the title. So what I did was I realized that it, the land had been further subdivided around the time that I was looking at. So I purchased the survey plan for the area, which you can also do from Titles Queensland, and it listed the owner's name that was subdividing the land on it. So I found out their name that way, a sneaky little trick. And I was very happy with myself after that. So the third interesting thing that I uncovered this week was the War Service Homes Scheme. Now this was a government scheme that was designed to build and provide affordable homes for returned servicemen or their uh, dependent family if they had lost their life during the war. So their widows or their children or their elderly mothers, that type of thing. Now this scheme um, was Australia wide, but the house I was looking at at Corinda was part of a pocket of land that had been purchased by the War Service Homes Commission and they built the houses on each of the blocks. Now the way, part of the way that the War Services Commission kept the cost of their homes down was that they offered a standard set of designs that people could choose a house from. And that's exactly what happened to this house in Corinda. It was part of a strip of homes that were built for the scheme. And indeed, when I looked into the owner, the first owner of the house, they had served in the First World War. It was quite an interesting scheme and in this climate with a lot of talk about affordable housing, it's interesting to look back and reflect on some of these early government schemes and, um, whether the, and think about whether or not they would work these days. So the fourth story I have is a bit of a sad one and it involves uh, a woman having to make the decision to place her child into Nudgee Orphanage. And it came about when I was researching a block of flats at New Farm. Now, 
there's a whole other long, very long video I need to do about the flat boom in Brisbane in the 1930s and particularly in the suburb of New Farm and women building and running these uh, apartment complex as a way to support themselves. But we'll park that for another day. The flats that I was investigating were built by a lady called Mary Healy and she had a daughter, Margaret, and they actually had side-by-side -side flat buildings that they ran. Now, Margaret uh, actually found herself pregnant and she wasn't married at the time and the story is that her father refused to let her marry the father of the child. So in these days an unmarried pregnant woman faced heartbreaking decisions and very difficult decisions as well. She, she, if she chose to keep the child she was often ostracized by her family and friends and her child also would have suffered similar stigma as well. Then you had to face raising a child on your own while supporting yourself as a woman. There was no welfare um, available from the government. So there were very um, difficult choices to be made for Margaret when she found herself in that position. So she eventually decided to place uh, the little boy in the orphanage at Nudgee. Now this was a church run institution and it would have been a heartbreaking decision, I think, for Margaret to have had to make. It really highlighted the terrible decisions and the difficult situation that young women that found themselves pregnant and unmarried in those days had to face. So that was a sad, but also an interesting story as well. Okay, the fifth and final story I want to tell you that came out of my research this week is also about the block of flats at New Farm. And this came about completely um, by chance. I was able to get in touch with the previous owners of the building and I went and met with them and had a chat. And they told me that they had run the building as a guest house for gay men. So I was blown away by this because this is not something I had come across in my research. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but it's actually more difficult to find out things about more recent history from the 80s and 90s than it is to find out much older history. So in talking to them, I was able to get first-hand stories about how they ran this building and the people that stayed there and that type of thing. So that was quite incredible. But I was first of all thinking, okay, this is early 1990s that they owned it. How, this was on the back of the Joe Bioffi Peterson dark ages uh, where homosexuality was not tolerated at all and so I did a bit more research and it turns out that the Goss Labor government, Queensland Labor government, actually decriminalized homosexuality in 1991. So that opened the way for places like this to operate out in the open and offer services specifically for gay men and it was just an absolutely fascinating story to uncover. And they had some great stories to tell as well, uh, particularly about one resident who uh, kept running around the place naked and had to be asked nicely to leave because he was disrupting the other guests. Uh, but the other story, which I never would have come across either, was that when they bought the place, they installed a big domed ceiling in the dining area and they had it painted in a sort of Renaissance style with clouds and, you know, these whimsical images of naked men. So they actually also had some photos of that, which was fantastic. I'll show them here with fig leaves. And so, yeah, not surprisingly, the next owners, uh, one of the first things they did apparently was paint over those images but it was a fascinating um, hearing the stories from them as well and I was also surprised to hear um, that they said that they were very well accepted in the local area and New Farm and they had a really good rapport with the local police as well and in fact the police would sometimes bring them young gay men who had got into trouble or didn't have anywhere else to go and the owners of the lodge would put them up um, until they got back on their feet basically so just amazing stories like that that I never would have uncovered in any archives they come purely out of talking to previous owners and, and getting the stories directly from them so that was a wonderful experience and an insight into an area that I don't think a lot of people who weren't in that scene would know about. All right, so that brings us to the end of this week's Detective Diaries. I hope you have enjoyed watching and I'll see you next time.